Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Intel AI Lounge uh, and joining us here for this Autonomous World event. Uh, my name is Jack. I'm the chief architect of our autonomous driving solutions at Intel. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here and to be joined uh, by an esteemed panel of colleagues who are going to hope engage you all in, in a great dialogue and discussion. There will be time for questions as well. So keep your questions in mind, jot them down uh, so you can ask them to us later. Um, so first, let me introduce the panel. Uh, next to me, we have Michelle, who is the co-founder uh, and CEO of FindMine. Uh, she just did an interview here shortly. FindMine is a company that provides a technology platform for retailers and brands uh, that uses artificial intelligence as the heart of the experiences uh, that her company's technology provides. Uh, Joe uh, from Intel is the head of partnerships and acquisitions for artificial intelligence and software technologies. Uh, he led uh, the, uh, or participated in the recent acquisition of Movidius, a computer vision company uh, that Intel recently acquired and is involved in a lot of smart city activities as well. And then finally, Suresh, uh, who's a data scientist by trade but now heads uh, JDA Labs, which is researching emerging technologies and their application in the supply chain uh, worldwide. So, at the end of the day, the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence really pr uh, is promises to improve our lives uh, in quite incredible ways and change the way that we live and work. Uh, oftentimes, the first thing that we think about when we think about AI is Skynet, uh, but we at Intel believe in AI for good uh, and that there's a lot of things that can happen to improve the way people live, uh, work, uh, and enjoy uh, life. Uh, so as things in the Internet of Things become connected, um, smart, and automated, Artificial intelligence is really going to be at the heart of those new experiences. Uh, so as I said, in my role as the architect for autonomous driving, uh, it's a common place where people think about uh, artificial intelligence, because what we're trying to do is replace uh, a human brain with a machine brain, which means we need to endow that machine with intelligence, thought, context, experiences, all of these things that sort of make us human. Uh, so computer vision is a space, obviously, with cameras in your car that people often think about, but it's actually more complicated than that. You know, how many of us have been in a situation on a two-lane road, maybe there's a car coming towards us, there's a road off to the right, and you sort of sense, you know, you know what, that car might turn in front of me, right? There's no signal, there's no real physical cue, but there's something about what that driver is doing, where they're looking, tells us. So what do we do? We take our foot off the accelerator, we maybe hover it over the brake, just in case, right? But that's intelligence that we take for granted through years and years and years of driving experience that tells us something interesting is happening there. And so that's the challenge that we face in terms of how to bring that level of human intelligence uh, into machines to make our lives uh, uh, better and richer. So. Enough about automated vehicles, though. Uh, let's uh, talk to our panelists about some of the areas in which they have uh, expertise. So first for Michelle, I'll ask, um, uh, you know, many of us probably buy stuff online every day, every week, every hour, with hourly delivery now. So a lot has been written about sort of the death of traditional retail experiences. How will artificial intelligence and the technology that your company has sort of rejuvenate that retail experience, whether it be online or in a traditional brick and mortar store? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. So one of the things that I think is a uh, common misconception when you hear about like the, uh, the death of the brick and mortar store, the growth of e-commerce, is really that e-commerce is beating brick and mortar in growth only. Mm -hmm. And there's still over 90% of, e of the world's commerce is done in physical brick and mortar stores. So e-commerce, while it has the growth, has a really long way to go. Um, and I think one of the things that's going to be really hard to replace is the, uh, the very human element of um, interaction and connection that you get by going to a store. Mm -hmm. So just because a, a, a robot named Pepper comes up to you and asks you some questions, like they might get you the answer you need faster and maybe more efficiently, um, but I think as humans we crave interaction and shopping for certain products especially is a, uh, an experience better enjoyed in person with other people, whether that's uh, an associate in the store or people you come with to the store to enjoy that experience with you. So I think artificial intelligence can help it be a more frictionless experience, whether you're in-store or online, to get you from point A to like buying the thing you need faster. Um, but I don't think that it's going to ever completely replace the, it, the joy that we get yeah. by physically going out into the world, interacting with other people to buy, to buy products. Cool. You said something really profound. You said that the real revolution for artificial intelligence in retail will be invisible. What did you mean by that? Yeah, so right now I think that most of the artificial intelligence uh, that's being applied in the retail space 
is actually not something that shoppers like you and I see mm -hmm. when we're on a website or when we're in the store. Um, it's actually happening behind the scenes. It's happening to dynamically change the web page to show you different stuff. It's mm -hmm. happening to um, further up the supply chain, right? Um, with how the products are getting manufactured, put together, packed, shipped, delivered to you. And that efficiency is just helping retailers be smarter and more effective with um, their budgets. Mm -hmm. And so as they can save money right in the supply chain as they can sell more products with less work. Um, they can reinvest in experience, they can reinvest in the brands, they can reinvest in the, the quality of the products. So we might start noticing those things change, but you won't actually know that that has anything to do with artificial intelligence because it's not always in a robot yeah. that's rolling up to you in an aisle. So you mentioned the supply chain, um, and uh, Suresh, that's something that we hear about a lot. Um, but frankly, for most of us, I think it's very hard to understand what exactly that means. So could you educate us a bit on what exactly is the supply chain and how is artificial intelligence being applied to improve it? Sure, sure. So um, for a lot of us, supply chain is either a term that we picked up at, uh, when we went to school or we read about it every so often, but we're not that far away from it. It is, in fact, a, a key part of what Michelle calls the um, invisible uh, part of the of, of one's experience. So when you go to a store and you're buying a pair of shoes or you're picking up a box of cereal, how often do we think about how did it ever make its way here? You know, were the, were the constituent components, they probably came from the multiple countries, and so they had to be manufactured, they had to be assembled in these plants, they had to then be moved either through ocean you know, vessel or through trucks. They probably have gone through multiple warehouses and distribution centers and then finally into the store. And what do we see? We want to make sure that when I go to pick up my favorite brand of cereal, it, it better be there. And so one of the things where AI is going to help, um, and we're doing um, a lot of active work in this, is in the notion of the self-learning supply chain. And what that means is really bringing in these various assets and actors of the supply chain, first of all, through IoT and others, you know, generating the data, obviously connecting them, and through AI, you know, deriving the intelligence so that I can dynamically, you know, figure out the fact that the uh, ocean vessel that left China on its way to Long Beach has been delayed by 24 hours. What does that mean when you go to a footlocker to buy your new pair of shoes? Can I, can I come up with alternate sourcing decisions? So it's not just predicting, it's prescribing and recommending as well. So behind the scenes, bringing in a lot of the, generating a lot of the data, connecting a lot of these actors, and then really deriving the smarts. That's what uh, the self-learning supply chain is all about. Okay. Are supply chains always international, or can they be local as well? Uh, definitely local as well. I think that what we've seen over the last uh, you know decades has been, it's kind of gotten more and more global, mm -hmm. but um, a lot of the supply chain can really just be within the store as well. But you'd be surprised at how often retailers do not know where their product is. Even is it in the front of the store? Is it in the back of the store? Is it in the fitting room? Even that local information is not really available. So to have sensors to uh, discover where things are and to really you know, uh, provide that efficiency, which right now doesn't exist, is, is a key part of what we're doing. Right. So Joe, as you look at companies out there to partner uh, or potentially acquire, uh, do you tend to see uh, technologies that are very domain specific, you know, sort of like for retail or supply chain, or do you see technologies that could bridge multiple different domains in terms of the experiences we could enjoy? Yeah, definitely. So both. Um, a lot of infant technologies start out in very niche use cases, uh, but then there are technologies that are pervasive across uh, multiple geographies and multiple markets. So smart cities is a good way to look at that, right? Um, so let's level set really quick on, on smart cities and how we think about that. I have a little sheet here to help me. All right, so um, if, if uh, anybody here played uh, SimCity before, okay, <laughs> you, have your, you have your little city that's a real world that sits here, okay? So this is reality, and you have little buildings and cars, and they all travel around, um, and you have people walking around with cell phones. And what's happening is, as we develop smart cities, we're putting sensors everywhere. We're putting them uh, around, you know, utilities, energies, water. They're in our phones. We have uh, cameras and we have audio sensors in our phones. We're placing these on light poles, uh, which is existing, you know, uh, sustainable, uh, excuse me, sustaining power points around the city. Uh, so we have all these different sensors, and they're not just cameras and microphones, but they're particulate sensors, okay? Mm -hmm. they're, they're able to do environmental monitoring, things like that. And so what we have is we have this physical world with all these sensors here. And then what we have 
is we've created basically this, this virtual world that has a great memory because it has all the data from all those sensors. And those sensors really act as ties. If you think of it like a quilt, tying a quilt together, you bring it down together and everywhere you have a stitch, you're stitching that virtual world on top of the physical world. And that just enables incredible amounts of innovation and creation uh, for developers, for entrepreneurs to do whatever they want to do to create and solve specific problems. Um, so what really makes that uh, possible is uh, communications, right, and connectivity. Mm -hmm. So that's where 5G comes in. So with 5G, it's not just a faster form of connectivity, right? It's new infrastructure, it's new uh, communication, includes multiple types of communication and connectivity. And what it allows it to do is all those little sensors can talk to each other again, okay? So the camera on the light pole can talk to the, the vehicle driving by, mm -hmm. okay? Or, or the sensor on the light pole. And so uh, you, you start to connect everything and that's really where artificial intelligence can now come in and sense what's going on, right? Okay, it can then uh, reason, which is neat, right? To have a computer or some sort of algorithm that actually reasons based on a situation that's happening in real time. And then acts on that but then you can iterate on that or you can adapt that in the future. So if we think of a, an actual use case, we'll think of a camera on a light post that observes an accident, all right? Well, it's programmed to automatically notify emergency services that there's been an accident, but it knows the difference between a fender bender and an actual major crash where we need to send an ambulance or maybe multiple fire trucks, right? And then you can create iterations and that learns to become more smart. Let's say there was a vehicle that was in the accident that had a little yellow placard on it that said hazard. Right? You're going to want to send different types of emergency services out there. So you can iterate mm -hmm. on what it actually does. And that's a fantastic world to be in. And that's where I see AI really playing. That's a great example of what, it, what it's uh, all about in terms of making things smart, you know, connected and autonomous. Um, so Michelle is somebody who's a, founded a company in this space uh, with technology that's trying to bring some of these experiences to market. There may be folks in the audience who have aspirations to do the same. So what have you learned over the course of starting your company and developing the technology that you're now deploying to market? Yeah, I think because AI is such a buzzword, right? Like you can get a .ai domain now. Um, doesn't mean that you should use it for everything, right? Maybe seven, 10, 15 years ago, like these trends have happened before, right? In the, in the late 90s, it was technology and there was like technology companies and they sat over here and there was everybody else. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not true anymore. Every company uses technology. Then fast forward a little bit, there was like social media was a thing. Social media was these companies over here and then there's everybody else and now every company needs to use social media yeah. or actually maybe not maybe it's a really bad idea for you to spend <laughs> a ton of money on social media and you have to make that choice for yourself so the same thing is true with artificial intelligence and what I tell um, you know uh, venture capitalists I did a panel on AI for venture capitalists um, last week trying to help them figure out like when to invest and how to evaluate and all that kind of stuff. And what I would tell other aspiring entrepreneurs is AI is a means to an end mm -hmm. it's not an end in itself so unless you're uh, you know, PhD in machine learning and you want to start an AI as a service business, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to start an AI only company. Yeah. You're going to start a company for a specific purpose to solve a problem and you're going to use AI as a means to an end, maybe, if it makes sense, to get there to make it more efficient mm -hmm. and all that stuff. But if you wouldn't get up every day for 10 years to do this business that's going to solve whatever problem you're solving, or if you wouldn't invest in it if AI didn't exist, then adding .ai at the end of the <laughs> domain is like not it's not going to work. Cool. So don't think that that will help Good. you make a better business. That's great advice. Thank you. Uh, Suresh, as you talked about sort of the automation then of the supply chain, um, what about people? You know, what about the workers, you know, whose, whose jobs may be lost or displaced because of the introduction of this automation? What's your perspective on that? Well, that's a great question. It's, it's one that I'm asked quite a bit, right? So if you think about the supply chain with a lot of the manufacturing plants, with a lot of the distribution centers, a lot of the transportation, not only are we talking about driverless cars, as in cars that you and I own, we're talking about driverless delivery vehicles. Uh, we're, we're talking about drones and all of these, if you, you know, to, on, the, on the surface, appears like it's going to displace human beings. You know, what humans used to do, now machines will do and potentially do better. So what, what are the implications around, um, around human beings? So uh, I'm asked that question quite a bit, especially from our customers. And my, my general percept, you know, uh, perception on this is that um, I'm actually cautiously optimistic that human beings will continue to do things that are strategic, human beings will continue to do things that are creative, and human beings will probably continue to do things that are truly catastrophic. 
that, that, that machines simply have not been able to learn because it doesn't happen very often. The um, one thing that comes to mind is when ATM machines came about several years ago, before my time, um, that displaced a lot of teller jobs in the banking industry. But the banking industry did not go belly up. They found other things to do. If anything, they offered more services. There were more branches that were closed. And if I were to ask any of you now, if you would go back and not have 24-7 access to cash, <laughs> you would probably laugh at me. Right? So, so the thing is, uh, this is AI, uh, AI for good. I think these things might have temporary impacts in terms of what it will do to labor and to human beings, but I think um, we as human beings will find bigger, better, different things to do, and uh, that's just been the nature of the, the human journey. Yeah, there's definitely a social acceptance angle to this technology, right? Uh, uh, many of us technologists in the room, right, it's kind of easier for us to sort of understand what the technology is, how it works, how it was created. Um, but for many of our friends and family, they don't, right? So there's a social acceptance uh, angle to this. So, uh, Michelle, as you see this technology kind of deployed in, in retail environments, which is a space where almost every person in every country goes, um, you know, how, how do you think about making it feel comfortable for people to interact with this kind of technology and not be sort of afraid of the robots or the machines sort of behind the curtain? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that user experience always has to come first. Mm -hmm. So if you're asking your, if you're using, using AI for AI's sake or mm -hmm. for the cool factor or the wow factor, you're already doing it wrong. <laughs> Again, it needs to solve a problem. And yeah. um, what I tend to tell people who are like, oh my God, like, you know, AI sounds so scary. Like, we can't let this happen. I'm like, it's already happening and you're already liking it. <laughs> you just don't know, right? Because it's invisible in yeah. a lot of ways. So if you can point out those scenarios where AI has already benefited you mm -hmm. and it wasn't scary because it was a friendly kind of interaction mm -hmm. uh, and you might not even realize it was there versus like something that looks so different and, and, and like panic driving. I think that's why the driverless car thing is a, is a big deal because mm -hmm. you're so used to seeing in America at least someone on the left side of the car in the front seat yeah. and not seeing that is like, whoa, <laughs> crazy. So I think that it starts with the experience and making it an acceptable kind of... Um, interface or mm -hmm. format that doesn't give you that, oh my God, something mm -hmm. is wrong here kind mm -hmm. of feeling. Yeah, that's a great answer. In fact, it reminds me there was this um, really amazing study by a professor called Nicholas Ep Epley uh, that was published in the Journal of Social Psychology, and, and the name of the study was called A Mind in a Machine. And what he did was he took um, uh, subjects and had a, a, a fully functional uh, automated vehicle, and then a second identical fully functional automated vehicle, but this one had a name and it had a voice and it had sort of a personality. So it had human, you know, anthropomorphic sort of characteristics. And he took people through these two different scenarios, uh, and in both scenarios he was evil, and he kind of introduced a crash in the scenario where there was, it was unavoidable, there was nothing gonna happen, you were gonna get into an accident in these cars, and then afterwards he pulled the subject to say, well, what did you, what did you feel about that accident? Or what did you feel, first, what did you feel about the car? They were more comfortable in the one that sort of had anthropomorphic features. They felt it was safer, and they'd be more willing to get into it, which is kind of not terribly surprising. But the kicker was the accident. In the, in the vehicle that had a voice and a name, they actually didn't blame the self-driving car they were in. They blamed the other car. But in the car that didn't have anthropomorphic features, they blamed the machine. They said there's something wrong with that car. So just it's one of my favorite studies because I think it does sort of illustrate that we have to remember sort of the human element to these experiences. And as artificial intelligence sort of begins to replace uh, humans, or some of us even, uh, we need to remember that we are still social beings and how we interact with other things, whether they be human or, or non-human, is important. Um, so, uh, Joe, you know, uh, uh, you talk about sort of evaluating companies. Uh, Michelle started a company. Um, she's gotten funding. As you go out and look at new companies that are starting up, there's just so much activity. Companies that just add .ai to the name, uh, as Michelle said. How do you cut through the noise and sort of try to get to the heart of is there any value in the technology that company's bringing or not? Definitely. Well, each company has its unique special sauce, right? Uh, and so just to reiterate what Michelle was talking about, we look for companies that are really good at doing what they do best, whatever that may be, whatever that problem that they're solving that a customer is willing to pay for. Uh, we want to make sure that that company is doing that. No one wants a company that just has AI in the name. 
Um, so we look for that, number one. And the other thing we do is uh, once we establish that we have a need or we're looking at a company based on uh, either talent or intellectual property, we'll go and we'll have to do a vetting process. And it takes a whole, uh, it's, it's a very long process and there's legal involved, but uh, at the end of the day, the most important thing for the startup to remember is to continue doing what they do best and continue to build upon their special sauce and make sure that uh, that is very valuable to their customer. And if someone else wants to look at them for acquisition, so be it, but you need to be maniacally focused on your own customers. That's kind of my two cents. Okay. I'm thinking again about this concept of sort of embedding human intelligence, um, but humans have biases, right? And sometimes those biases aren't always good. So how do we, uh, as technologists in this industry, um, sort of try to create AI for good and not unintentionally put some of our own human biases into models that we train about you know, what's socially acceptable or not. Anyone have any thoughts on that? Here you go. I, Michelle, go ahead. Um, I actually think that the hype about AI taking over and could destroy humanity, <laughs> it's possible, and I don't want to disagree with Stephen Hawking because he's <laughs> way smarter than I am. Um, but, I mean, he kind of recognizes it's... it's could go both ways. Mm -hmm. And so right now we're in a world where we're still feeding the machine, mm -hmm. right? And so there's a bunch of different, you know, issues that came up with humans feeding the machine with their foibles of racism and hatred and mm -hmm. bias and mm -hmm. yeah. humans experience shame which causes them to kind of lash out and yeah. want to put somebody else down, right? And so we saw that with Tay, the Microsoft chatbot. We mm -hmm. saw that with um, even like Google's uh, um, fake news, right? They're like picking sources now to, to answer the question in the top box that might be the wrong source. Mm -hmm. um, ads that Google serves often show men, you know, high paying jobs, $200,000 a year jobs, and women don't get those same ones. Mm -hmm. So if you trace that back, it's always coming back to the inputs and the lens that humans are kind of coming at it from. Mm -hmm. So I actually think that we could be in a way better place, like after the six singularity happens and the machines are smarter than us and they take over and they become our overlords. Because when we think about the future, it's a very common tendency for humans to like fill in the blanks that w what you don't know in the future with mm -hmm. um, what's true today. And I was talking to you guys at lunch, we were talking about this Harvard um, psychology professor yeah. who wrote a book and he, he, in the book he was talking about how in the 1950s, you know, they were imagining the future in all these sci-fi stories. And they have flying cars and hovercrafts and they're living in space. but the woman still stays at home and everyone's white. So they, they forgot to like extrapolate the social things and like paint the picture in. So I think when we're extrapolating into the future where the computers are our overlords, we're painting them with our current reality, mm -hmm. which is where humans are kind of terrible. <laughs> and maybe <laughs> computers won't be, and they'll actually create this like utopia for us. Mm -hmm. So it could be positive. That's, yeah. that's a very positive view. Thanks. That's great. So, so do we do we have this all figured out? You know, are there any sort of big challenges that remain? You know, in in our industries. So, well, I did want to add um, a, a little bit more to the sure. learning because um, you know I'm a, a data scientist by training, and a lot of times <laughs> I, I run into folks who think that everything's been figured out. Everything is done. This is so cool. It's all uh, good to go. And one of the things that I share with them. Is, is something that I'm sure everyone here can relate to. So if a, if a kindergartner goes to school and s starts to spout profanity, that's not because the kid knows anything good or bad. The, the, that is what the kid has learned at home. Likewise, if we don't train machines well, its training will in fact be um, you know, biased, mm -hmm. to, your, to your point. So one of the things that we have to keep in mind when we talk about this is, we have to be careful as well because we're the ones doing the training. It, it, it doesn't automatically know what is good or bad unless that set of data is also fed to it. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to, wanted to kind of add That's to your... Good, thank you. So why don't we open it up a little bit for questions. Um, any questions in the audience for our panelists? Yep, there's one there, it looks like. I mean, we'll get to you soon. Uh, based on what you just said uh, about us training, uh, or you all, I guess, training these models and, and, and teaching them things. So I guess when you deploy these models to the public uh, with them being machine learning and AI based, is, is it possible for us to retrain them? And how do you kind of build in redundancies for the public, kind of, you know, like throwing off your model and things like that? What are some of the considerations that go into that? Well, one thing for sure is training is continuous. 
So uh, no system should be trained once deployed and then forgotten. And so th that is something that we as AI professionals need to be absolutely, because uh, trends change as well. What was, what was uh, optimal two years ago is no longer optimal. So um, that part needs to continue to happen. And, and where the whole IoT space is so important is it will continue to generate relevant uh, consumable data that these machines can continue to learn. So how do you decide what data though is good or bad to as you retrain and evolve that model over time? You know, as a data scientist, how do you do sort of selection uh, on, on data? So, and I want to piggyback on what Michelle said because she's spot on. What is the problem that you're trying to solve? <laughs> it always starts from there because we, we have folks who, who come in, the CIOs, oh look, when, when, when big data was hot, we started to collect a lot of the data and nothing has happened. And so, uh, b but data by itself doesn't <laughs> automatically do magic for you. you know, so we ask, what kind of problem are you trying to solve? Are you trying to figure out what kinds of products to sell? So are you trying to figure out the optimal assortment mix for you? Are you trying to find the shortest path in order to get to your stores? And then, then the question is, do you now have the right data to solve that problem? Mm -hmm. A lot of times we put the science, and th I'm, a, I'm a data scientist by training, I would love to talk about the science, but really it's the problem first the data and the science that, that, that come after right. that. Thanks, good advice. Any other questions in the audience? Yeah, there's one right up here. <laughs> test, test, can you hear me? Yep. So with AI and machine learning becoming more commonplace and becoming more accessible to developers and uh, visionaries and, and thinkers alike, right, rather than being just a uh, a giant warehouse with a ton of machines and you get one tiny kind of machine learning. Do you foresee more governance coming to play in terms of what AI is allowed to do and the decisions of what training data is allowed to be fed to AIs in terms of influence? You know, you've, you're talking about like, you know, data determining if it's an AI will become good or bad, but humans being the ones responsible for the training in the first place, obviously they can use that data to influence as they speak. It's kind of like the governance and, and the influence, right? Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. take that? I'll take a quick stab at it. So, so yes, it's going to be an open discussion. It's going to have to take place because really they're just machines. It's machine learning. We teach it. We teach it what to, what to do, how to act. It's just an extension of us. And in fact, I think you had a really great conversation or at, um, a statement at lunch uh, where you talked about uh, your product being an extension mm -hmm. of a designer because, and, and we can get into that a little bit, but really it's just going to do what we tell it to do. So uh, there's definitely going to have to be discussions about what type of data we feed. It's all going to be centered around the use case and what best solves the use case. But I imagine that that will be a topic of discussion for a long time mm -hmm. uh, about what we're going to decide to do. So if you want to comment on this thought of taking a designer's brain and putting it into a model somehow? <laughs> well, actually, what I, was, what I wanted to say was that I think... Um, I think that like the regulation and the kind of um, governance around it is going to be self-imposed by the developer and data science community first. Because I feel like even the experts who have been doing this for a long time don't really have their arms fully around what we're dealing with here. Exactly. And so to expect our, our senators, our congressmen and women to actually make like regulation around it is, is a lot because they're not technologists by training. They have a lot of other stuff going on. Mm -hmm. If the community that's already doing the work doesn't quite know what we're dealing with, then how can we expect them to get there? So I feel like that's gonna be a, a long way off, but I think that the people who touch and feel and, 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 and deal with models and with data sets and stuff every day are the kind of people who are going to get together and kind of self-regulate for a while if they're good-hearted people, right? We talk about AI for good, yeah. some people are bad, those people won't respect those, those covenants that, that we come up with, but I think that's the place we have to start. Yeah. So really you're saying, I think for, for data scientists and those of us working in this space, we kind of have a, a social, ethical, or moral obligation to humanity to ensure that our work is used for good. No pressure. <laughs> okay, <laughs> none taken. Sure. <laughs> good. Any other questions? Anything I just wanted to uh, talk about the second part of what you said. Um, We've been um, working with a company that um, builds robots for the store, you know, a store associate, if you will. And one of, the, one of their very interesting findings was that um, the greatest acceptance of it right now has been at car dealerships. 
Because when someone goes to a car dealer, and we all have had terrible experiences doing that, that's why we've tried to buy it online, <laughs> but um, just this perception that a robot would be unbiased, that it will give me information without, hmm. without the, you know, trying the to push me cell. one way or the other. Mm. So there's that perception side of it too, that isn't the governance part of your question, but more the biased perception side of what you said, which I think is fascinating how we're already trained to kind of think that this is going to have an unbiased hmm. um, opinion, whether or not that's true. Hmm. Right? That's fascinating. Very <clears throat> cool. Thank you, Suresh. Any other questions in the audience? No? Okay. Um, so, may I, I could ask, you've got a station over there that talks a little bit more about your company, but for those that haven't seen it yet, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, what, what is the experience like or how is the, the shopping experience different for someone that's using your company's technology than, than what it was before? Ooh, free advertising. Yeah. I would love to. <laughs> um, no, but actually, I, I started this company because as a consumer, I found myself, going back to the user experience piece, mm -hmm just constantly frustrated with the user experience of buying products one at a time and then getting zero help. And then here I am having to like Google how to wear a white blazer to not look like an idiot in the morning when I get dressed with my white blazer that I just bought and I was excited about. Um, and it's a really simple thing, which is like, how do I use the product that I'm buying? Mm -hmm. And that really simple thing has been just abysmally like handled um, in the retail industry because the only tools that the retailers have right now are mm -hmm. manual. So in fashion, some of our fashion customers, like John Barbados is an example we have over there. It's like a designer uh, for high-end high men's mm -hmm. clothing. Um, and John Barbados is a person. Like, it's not just a named yeah. company. He's an actual person, and he has a vision for what he wants his products to look like and the, the aesthetic and the style, and there's like a rock star vibe. And to get that information into the organization, he would share it verbally mm -hmm. with PDFs, things like that. And then his team of merchandisers would literally go manually make outfits on one page mm -hmm. and then go make an outfit on another page with the same exact items. And then products would go out of stock and they'd go around in circles. And that's a terrible, yeah. terrible job. So to your, the conversation earlier about people losing jobs because of artificial intelligence, I hope people do lose jobs and I hope <laughs> they're the terrible jobs that no one wanted to do in the first place. Because the merchandisers that we help, like the one from John Marvados literally said she was like weeks away from quitting and she got a new boss and said, if you don't fix this part of my job, I'm out of here. Wow. And he had heard about us, he knew about us, and so he brought us in to solve that problem. So I don't think mm. it's always a bad thing because if we can take that kind of rote, boring, repetitive task off of humans' plates, mm. what more amazing things can we do with our brain that is only human and mm -hmm. very unique to us? Mm -hmm. And how much more can we advance ourselves and our society by giving the boring work to a robot or a yeah. machine. Well, that's fantastic. So Joe, when you talk about smart cities, uh, it seems like people have been talking about smart cities for, for decades. Mm -hmm. uh, and often people cite you know, funding issues, the regulatory environment, or all, a host of other reasons why these things sort of haven't happened. Do you think we're on the cusp of breaking through there, or what challenges still remain for uh, fulfilling that vision of a smart city. I do. I do think we're on the cusp. Um, I think a lot of it has to do largely actually with 5G and connectivity, the, the ability to process and send all this data that needs to be shared mm -hmm. um, across the system. Um, I also think that we're getting closer and more conscientious about security, which is a major issue mm. with IoT, making sure that our end devices or our edge devices, those things out there sensing, uh, are secure. Um, and I think interoperability is something that we need to champion as well uh, and make sure that we uh, basically work together to enable these systems. They're very, very difficult uh, to create little tiny walled gardens of solutions in a, in a, in a smart city. You may corner a certain part of the market, uh, but you're definitely not going to have that uh, ubiquitous uh, benefit to society. Uh, if, if you establish those little walled gardens. So those are the areas I think we need to, to focus on, and I think we are making serious progress in all of them. Okay, yeah. very good. Uh, Michelle, you mentioned earlier that artificial intelligence is kind of all around us in lots of places and things we do on a daily basis, but we probably don't realize it. Uh, could you share a couple of examples? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so I think everything you do online for the most part, <laughs> literally anything you might do, whether it's Googling something or you go to some article, mm -hmm. um, the ads might be dynamically picked mm -hmm. for you mm -hmm. using machine learning models that have decided what is appropriate based on you and your treasure trove of data that you have out there that you're giving up all the time and not yeah. really understanding you the you're giving up. The shoes that follow up. you around the internet, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so that's basically anything online. I'm trying to think of in the real world. I think that 
uh, to your point earlier about the supply chain, like just picking a box of cereal off the shelf and taking it home, there was no artificial intelligence in that at all. But the supply chain behind it, so the supply chain behind like mm -hmm. pretty much everything we do, even in television, right? Like how media gets to us and gets consumed at some point in the supply chain, there's artificial intelligence playing in there yeah. as well. So it's rushing a supply chain where we can get same day, even within the hour sort of delivery. How do you, how do you get better than that? You know, what, what's, what's coming that's innovative in the supply chain that, that will be new in the future? Well, um, so th that is one example of it, but you'd be surprised at how inefficient the supply chain is, even with all the advances that have already gone in, whether mm -hmm. it's uh, the physical uh, advances around building modern warehouses and modern manufacturing plants, or whether it's through software and others that really, um, you know, do help schedule things and um, optimize things. There's what has happened in the, in the in the supply chain. Just given how they've evolved, is they're they're very siloed. Mm -hmm. So you know, a lot of times the manufacturing plant does things that the distribution folks do not know. That the distribution folks do things that the transportation folks don't know. And, and, and then the store folks know nothing other than when the, when the truck pulls up, that's the first time they find, uh, find out about things, right? So, so where, the, where the great um, opportunity in my mind is in, in the space that I'm in is really the generation of data, the connection of data, and finally the deriving the smarts that, that really help us improve efficiency. There's huge opportunity there. Okay. And, and again, we don't know it because it's all invisible to us. <laughs> Good. Good, let me pause and see if there's any questions in the audience. Oh, we got one there. Thank you. Hi, guys. You all right? Um, I just had a question about ethics and the teaching of ethics. As you were saying, we, we feed the uh, artificial intelligence, whereas in a scenario which is probably a little bit more uh, attuned to automated driving, in a car crash scenario between do we crash into two people or three people, I would be choosing to, whereas the scenario may be actually it's better to sh crash the car and kill myself. Mm -hmm. That thought would never go through my mind because I'm human. And I'm, yeah. My rule number one is self-preservation. So how do we teach the computer this sort of side of it? Is there actually the AI ethic going to be better than our own ethics? Mm -hmm. How do we start? Yeah, it's a great question. I think um, I think the opportunity is there, as Michelle was talking earlier about. You know, maybe when when you cross that chasm and you get this new singularity, maybe the AI ethics will be better than human ethics because we'll, the machine will be able to think about greater concerns than perhaps other than ourselves. Uh, but I, I think just for, from my point of view, working in the, in the space of automated vehicles, um, I think it is going to have to be something that, are, that the industry and, and societies, uh, and societies are different, right, in different geographies, in different countries. We have different ways of looking at the world. Uh, cultures value different things. And so I think um, technologists in those spaces are going to have to get together and sort of agree uh, amongst a community kind of from a social contract theory standpoint, perhaps, in a way that's going to be acceptable uh, to everyone who lives in that environment. Uh, I don't think we can come up with a, a uniform model that would apply to all spaces, but it's got to be something, though, that, that we all, as members of a community, uh, can accept and say, yep, you know, that would be the right thing to do you know, in that situation. Uh, and that's not going to be an easy task you know, by any means, which is, I think, you know, one of the reasons why you'll continue to see humans have an important role to play in automated vehicles so that the human could take over in exactly that kind of scenario, right? Because the machines perhaps aren't quite smart enough to, to do it, or but maybe it's not the smart to the processing capability. It's maybe that we haven't, as technologists and ethicists, gotten together long enough to figure out what are those moral and ethical frameworks that we could use to apply to those situations. Um, any other thoughts from yeah, the I, panel? Yeah, I wanted to jump in there real yeah. quick. Absolutely questions that need to be answered, but let's come together and make the solution that needs to have those uh, questions answered, right? So let's come together first and fix the problems that need to be fixed now so that we can build out those types of scenarios. We can now put our brain power to work to decide what to do next. Mm -hmm. um, there, was a, there was a quote, I believe, by Andrew Ning mm -hmm. um, from Baidu, and he was saying in con uh, concerning questions about um, uh, you know, what's gonna happen in the future with AI, are, are, we gonna be, are we gonna have AI overlords or anything like that? And he said, it's kind of like worrying about overpopulation uh, at the planet Mars, okay? Because mm -hmm. maybe we're gonna get there someday and maybe we're gonna send people there and maybe we're gonna establish uh, a, a human 
population on Mars, and then maybe it will get too big and we'll have problems on Mars. <laughs> but right now, we haven't landed on the planet. Um, and I thought that really does a good job of putting in perspective uh, the, that overall concern about AI taking over. Right. So when you think about AI being applied for good, and, and Michelle, you talked about don't do AI just for AI's sake, have a problem to solve. Um, I'll open it up to any of the three of you. You know, What's a problem in your, your life or in your work experience that you'd love somebody out here would go solve <laughs> with AI? <coughs> I, I okay? have one. Sorry, I want to okay. take this real quick. All right. There's roads blocked off and it's raining, and I have to walk a mile to find a taxi <laughs> to, in the rain right now after this to go home. Um, I would love for us to have some sort of ability to uh, manage parking spaces uh, and determine when and who can come into which parts of the city. And when there's a spot downtown, I want my autonomous vehicle to know which one's available and go directly to that spot. Mm -hmm. And I want it to be queued in a certain manner to where I'm, I'm, I'm next in line and I know uh, right, and so I would love for someone to go solve that problem. There's been some, there's been some development for, in, on the infrastructure side for that si that kind of a solution. Mm -hmm. um, we have a partnership Intel does with GE, and we're putting sensors that have, um, it's an IoT sensor. Basically, it's called City IQ. It has um, environmental monitoring, uh, audio, visual sensing, and it allows this type of use case to take place. So I would love to see iterations on that. I would love to see. Um, sorry, there's another one that I'm particular about. <laughs> I lived, growing up, I lived in Southern California, uh, right on the hill, right against the hills, a housing development against the hills, and there was um, uh, not a factory, but a bunch of uh, oil derricks back there. I would love to have a sensor that sensed the particulate in the air to see if there was too many fumes coming from that oil field into my, into my um, uh, yard growing up as a little kid. I would love for us to solve problems like that. So that's the type of thing that we'll be able to solve. Those are the types of innovations that will be able to take place once we have these sensors in place. So I'm gonna mm -hmm. sit down on that one and let yeah. someone else take it. <laughs> I'm really glad you said the second one because I was like thinking what I'm about to say is totally gonna trivialize Joe's pain and I don't wanna do that, but cancer is my yeah. answer. Um, because uh, there's so much data in health mm -hmm. and all these patterns are there waiting to be recognized. Yeah. Like there's so many things we don't know about cancer and so many indicators that we could capture if we just That's were right. able to amass the data mm -hmm. and take a look. But I knew a great, a brilliant company that was using artificial intelligence specifically around uh, image processing mm -hmm. to look at um, CAT scans mm -hmm. and figure out what the leading indicators might be mm -hmm. in a cancerous uh, scenario. And they pivoted to some way more trivial use, way more trivial yeah. problem, which is still a problem and not to trivialize, you know, parking and, and whatnot, but it's not cancer, right? Yeah. And they pivoted away from this amazing opportunity because of the privacy and the issues with HIPAA around yeah. health data. And I understand there's a ton of um, concern with getting into the wrong hands and hacking and all, and all of this yeah. stuff. I get that. But the opportunity, in my mind, far outweighs the the risk mm -hmm. um, and the fact that they had to change their business model and change their company essentially like broke my heart because yeah. they were really on to something. Yeah, that's a shame. It's funny you mentioned that Intel has an effort that we're calling the cancer cloud. What we're trying to do is provide some infrastructure to help with that problem. And, and the way cancer treatments work today is if you go to a university hospital, let's say here in Texas, um, how you interpret that scan and how you respond and apply treatment, that knowledge is basically just kept within that mm -hmm. hospital and within that staff. Uh, and so on the other side of the country, um, somebody could go in and get a scan, and maybe that scan's brand new to that facility, and so they don't know how to treat it. But if you had an opportunity with machine learning to sort of be able to compare scans from people, not only just in this country, but around the world, and, and understand globally all of the hundreds of different treatment paths that were applied to that particular kind of cancer, think how many lives could be saved because you're, then you're sharing knowledge um, with what treat courses of treatment worked. You know, but it's one of those things, like you say, sometimes it's the regulatory environment uh, or it's other factors that sort of hold us back from applying this technology to do some, to some really good things. So it's a great example. All right, any other questions in, in the audience? I have one. Good, Emily. If else does. Um, so this goes on off of the HIPAA question, which is, and you were talking about dis dynamically displaying ads earlier. What does privacy look like in a, in a fully autonomous world? Mm. Just a Anybody can answer that one. Question. Are we still private citizens? What does it how look about, like? How about from a supply chain standpoint? You, know, you can learn a lot about somebody in terms of the products that they buy. Of course. And I think to all of us, 
we sort of know maybe somebody's tracking what we're buying, but it's still kind of creepy when we think about how people could potentially use that against us, right? So how do you, from a supply chain standpoint, uh, approach that problem? Yeah, and it's, it's something that, that comes up in my life almost every day because <laughs> one, of the, one of the things we'd like to do is to understand consumer behavior. You know, how often am I buying? What kinds of products am I buying? Um, you know, what am I returning, right? And so for that, you need a transactional data. You, you really get to understand the individual. Now, that then starts to get into this uh, area of um, privacy. Do you know too much about me? Mm -hmm. right? And so um, a lot of times what, what, what we do is data is clearly anonymized, so all we know is customer A has this tendency, customer B has this tendency, mm -hmm. and that then helps the retailers you know, um, um, uh, offer the right products to these customers. But to your point, there, there are those privacy concerns, and I think uh, issues around governance, issues around ethics, issues around privacy, these will continue to uh, be ironed out. I don't think there's an answer, a solid answer for any of these just yet. Mm -hmm. and, and it's largely a reflection of society. How comfortable are we with how much privacy, right? Uh, right now, I believe we're, we put the individual in control of as much information as possible that they are able to release or not, right? And so a lot of, like you said, everyone's anonymizing everything at the moment. But it's really, that may change as society's values change slightly and we'll be able to adapt as necessary. Good. Why don't we uh, try to stump the panel? Anyone have any ideas on, on uh, things in your life you'd like to be solved with AI for good? Any suggestions out there? And we could then hear from our data scientists and technologists and folks here. Any ideas? No? All right, good. All right, well, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you for joining Intel here in the AI Lounge at Autonomous World. We hope you've enjoyed the panel, and we wish you a great... Uh, rest of your event here at South by Southwest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.